Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Nikolai Mu? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the alleged crime, then offer my analysis. Nikolai Mu was born on December 11, 1969, in Romania. He went by the name Nick. He and his family moved to the United States when he was about 15 or 16 years old. A church in Minnesota accepted the family as political refugees. After going to college in South Dakota, Nick became a mechanical engineer. Eventually, he married a woman named Sandra, and they settled down in Prior Lake, Minnesota. This is just south of Minneapolis. In 2020, Nick had a quadruple bypass following a heart attack, which left him with a sense of fragility. Now moving to the timeline of the alleged crime. On July 30, 2022, Nick, his wife Sandra, and several of their friends were at the Apple River in Somerset, Wisconsin, which is about an hour from Prior Lake, Minnesota. At 3.47 p.m., multiple calls were made to 911, from people on the Apple River near the Sunrise Bridge. The callers reported there had been a stabbing attack. When the police arrived, they found a 17-year-old named Isaac Schumann dead from a knife wound to the chest. In addition, four people were injured by a knife, Riley Madison, Dante Carlson, Tony Carlson, and A.J. Martin. A.J. was cut so badly, his intestines were protruding from his body. Witnesses said that an older, Russian-looking male was the perpetrator. At about 4.45 p.m., multiple witnesses reported seeing the suspect in Somerset. The police arrived and arrested Nick. Here's what the police found during the course of their investigation. Nick's wife, Sandra, told investigators that Nick was looking for a cell phone, which a member of their party lost in the Apple River. She saw a group of guys floating on tubes where Nick was searching for the phone when Nick returned to where the guys were for a second time, the guys moved off their tubes and started hitting him. She did not see what happened after that. Nick returned to where she was and said the men had been calling him offensive names. They attacked him with a knife, but he managed to take it away from them. The police interviewed the group of young people who had been on the tubes in the river. They said that they yelled for help because Nick was bothering them. More people came into the river and stood between them and Nick. These people ordered Nick to leave the area. During this confrontation, Nick punched or slapped a female member of this group who was confronting him. He was then punched by a male and knocked down into the river. Nick produced a small knife with a folding three-inch blade and started stabbing people. The police were able to locate a knife matching this description on the west bank of the river. One of the people in the river recorded a video at 3.44 p.m. In the video, Nick can be seen carrying goggles with a snorkel attached and running up to six male teenagers on tubes. He grabbed the tubes as if he was searching for something. The teenagers could be heard on the video telling him to get away. Nick then walked around the tubes and continued searching before walking away. He turned around and said something while pointing at the group. At this point, several teenagers converged on Nick and yelled at him to walk away. Members of the group were taunting Nick, suggesting that he was the type of person who would be interested in committing a crime related to sex. They claimed that he was looking for little girls, but there were no little girls there. More people started converging on this location from three sides. Eventually, there were 13 people around Nick. The young people were cackling like hyenas and continued to taunt Nick. At least one person touched his shoulder. At this point, Nick was confronted by two females, one wearing a one-piece swimsuit and the other wearing a two-piece swimsuit with flowers. During this confrontation, Nick retrieved a folding knife, opened the blade, and held the knife down at his right side. As the camera panned away from Nick, there was a sudden commotion. Several people moved toward Nick. The camera panned back and captured Nick falling into the water. As he was on his back, a man slapped the left side of his face. 
Still holding the knife, Nick returned to his feet and was shoved in the back by a man wearing yellow swimming trunks. This man was later identified as A.J. Martin. At this point, A.J. advanced on him. As Nick was being shoved back into the water, he stabbed A.J. in the abdomen. As Nick was standing there in the water with a knife in his right hand, he was touched by a man in the back. Nick turned around and made a stabbing motion toward him. Nick was once again shoved, this time near his neck. In response, he made another stabbing motion. There was blood in the water and on Nick's knife. During the altercation, Nick stabbed five people in total, one fatally. All of a sudden, the maniacal laughing of the group, consistent with experiencing sadistic pleasure, was replaced with screaming, confusion, and fear as they scattered throughout the river in a chaotic fashion. The police spoke to a woman who had confronted Nick named Madison Cohen. She claimed that Nick struck her, which is what caused someone else to strike him. Essentially, she was saying that Nick started the fight. The police spoke to Nick. He said the confrontation started after he went looking for a phone that his friend lost. He approached the group on the tubes and asked them if they had found a cell phone. They climbed off their tubes, came at him, and called him offensive names. They took a snorkel from him and attempted to pull down his swim trunks. Nick went into self-defense mode after being attacked by several people, two of whom were carrying knives. He managed to take away one of the knives and was swinging it in the air, but he did not remember if the knife made contact with anyone. According to Nick, he did not bring his own knife into the river, but admitted to having a knife with him that day. He wasn't certain where he left it. When Nick managed to escape the attackers and get back to his own group, he didn't tell them what happened because he didn't want them to confront the attackers. During his interview with the police, Nick made it clear that he had been afraid for his life. Nick was charged with one count of first-degree intentional homicide and four counts of attempted first-degree intentional homicide. His trial started on April 1, 2024. At the time I am making this video, the trial is underway. Now moving to my analysis. At Nick's trial, the defense argued that he was afraid for his life after being surrounded by an aggressive and intoxicated group of strangers. They were in his personal space and harassing him. He tried to leave at one point, but they followed him and attacked him. The prosecution argued that after Nick was taunted, menaced, and harassed by people on the river, he had many opportunities to leave. He punched a woman who had confronted him, which led to other people attacking him. He lied about having a knife and using his knife during the physical altercation. This brings me to the question, was Nick guilty of murder? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that he was guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. Nick approached the teenagers on the tubes and started searching for the phone without really explaining himself. He came up on them kind of quickly through the water, which could be interpreted as bizarre if not aggressive. None of the people who were taunting Nick were armed, yet Nick stabbed five of them as they crowded around him screaming insults. One of them died, and four of them were injured as a result of the stabbing. After the stabbing, Nick threw his knife into the river and lied to the police about some of the details. Moving to the exculpatory factors, Nick had no history of violence and no criminal record. The knife was in his pocket because he needed it to cut string earlier that day. Nick had a legitimate reason to approach the teenagers who were on the tubes in the river. He was looking for a phone, which had presumably floated downstream toward the group. The river is considered public. The teenagers did not have the authority to order Nick to leave. If they didn't want to be near him, they could have left. Nick was initially outnumbered 6 to 1 and eventually 13 to 1. Many, if not all, of the individuals were intoxicated and most were physically stronger than Nick. Many of the members of the crowd were harassing him and may have been trying to incite others to violence by making false claims about him looking for little girls. On two occasions during the confrontation, Nick tried to signal his group with his hand as if he needed assistance. When Nick walked away from the teenagers, they followed him. One of them said something to the effect of, you got 10 seconds, which is clearly a threat. The people harassing Nick put themselves between him and his group, which meant he really did not have an escape route. The only route not blocked was to a deeper part of the river. Some of the members of the group who were harassing Nick 
claimed that he punched or otherwise struck Madison, but their stories were inconsistent. Madison claimed that Nick punched her with his right hand, but by this point the knife was in his right hand. Also, she was not injured. It's more reasonable to believe that Nick simply pushed Madison because she was invading his personal space. After this alleged contact, Nick was attacked by a few people. Some of the attackers claimed that they were trying to help Nick. I guess they were using the little-known push-people-into-the-water method of assistance. Nick only started stabbing people after they attacked him, and he walked away when the attacks stopped. Only a few simple stabbing motions were involved. Nick did not chase anyone down and stab them five or ten times. His feet were planted when he made these stabbing motions. At least one witness on the shore thought that Nick was in trouble and was going to be attacked by the angry mob. Nick may have lied to the police afterward, but that doesn't change anything that happened during the actual altercation. Perhaps he lied because he did not want to get in trouble. When considering all the evidence in this case, do I believe that Nick was guilty of murder? No, I believe he was not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt and not guilty in reality. Nick defended himself against a group of aggressors using only the force necessary to escape. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. When the teenagers on the tube saw Nick approaching, they realized they had an easy target to make fun of. They applied the cancel culture mentality to an in-person event. The teenagers lied about what Nick was doing in order to embarrass him. Their behavior qualified as menacing, and they knew what they were doing was wrong. When Nick walked away, the teenagers followed him and continued to make false claims so other people would converge on him. They were looking for more trouble. They just couldn't let Nick go in peace. Missing their opportunity to express sadism was not acceptable. The tactic of the teenagers was similar to the bullying that occurs in a high school setting. A bunch of people gang up on one person who is vulnerable and keep taunting and threatening them, looking for some type of reaction to escalate the menacing. The other people who came to the scene were not looking to help, rather to join in the sadistic fun. They told Nick to go away as they blocked the route to his group, which put him in a no-win scenario. When Nick put his hand out and touched a woman to create a little space, that was all the justification the group required. This was the reaction they were looking for. Now they could start their attack like a pack of wolves. There was one thing the aggressors did not count on. Nick was willing to defend himself with a small knife. When Nick was defenseless, he was an excellent target. But when the stabbing started, the aggressors wanted nothing to do with him. All their arrogance, laughter, and confidence dissipated in seconds as they scattered like roaches when the lights are turned on. Now moving to my final thoughts. The theme of this case was a lack of empathy. No one understood how other people were feeling. Nick didn't appreciate how approaching the teenagers could be interpreted as bizarre and maybe even aggressive, and the young people didn't care about Nick's feelings. Rather, they were just looking for sadistic pleasure at his expense. The aggressors created a dangerous situation and when they met resistance, they immediately started playing the victim. A better tactic to remain alive and unharmed would involve not provoking a person to violence. The state ended up having inaccurate empathy for the aggressors and unwarranted contempt for the victim. Prosecutors decided to send Nick down the river, but instead they should have looked at the aggressors and said, cry me a river. Those are my thoughts on the case of Nikolai Mu, Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.